All right. Well, it's one o'clock, and uh, I'd like to welcome everybody to Candidate Boot Camp's webinar this afternoon, Dialing for Voters. Thanks for joining us today. All right. So we're going to begin by having an overview of today's webinar. The agenda today is talking about dialing for voters. How can you use the telephone to get your message out and reach voters? So we're going to discuss a few different tools that you can use, robocalls, live calls, teletown halls, um, also phone banks. Then we're going to have a Q&A session. And then finally, at, we'll have a link where we've got a couple of bonus downloads for you, for the people who've registered for the webinar. Um, we've got a couple of call scripts, one that your own volunteers can use to reach out to voters, and another one that would be more appropriate for uh, third parties who are, are calling on the candidate's behalf. And uh, we'll give you that download link and you'll be able to, to download those after the webinar. So before we begin, I wanted to start by uh, going over the campaign timeline. This is something that in, in Candidate Bootcamp, uh, we use an awful lot in our training. We like to remind people of all the steps that are involved in creating a successful campaign, like to always do this sort of you are here uh, mode when we're talking about a, a particular topic. Um, one of the reasons we like to put this up is to emphasize how important we think preparation is in a successful campaign. So again, we're talking about using uh, phones for outreach today and the, the tools that we're gonna be talking about for the most part are gonna be used in the latter stages of a campaign. So. I wanted to mention that if you have any questions about the rest of the campaign, those preparation phases, you can visit the link that's on the screen right now. Um, that's an article that we have, a very comprehensive article on our website that uh, explains all the steps involved in, in how to run for office. And you can get a very good overview there. There's lots of downloads uh, that, that are available as well to help you prepare for your campaign and make sure you're ready to go. Another question that we get quite a bit, especially for small campaigns and first time candidates is how to allocate a budget. A lot of times uh, these, these budgets are pretty small and there are, what we see, one of the mistakes we see is there are lots of opportunities to waste money, spend them on things that really aren't gonna result in you getting votes, uh, hats, t-shirts, things like that. So for smaller campaigns, we like to suggest that you focus on things that are going to get you name recognition and get out the vote. So things like yard signs, palm cards, digital advertising, and phone outreach in no particular order uh, tend to be the most effective. So that's why we're on the webinar today is to talk about using phones for outreach. So. We're very pleased to have with us today Nick Pappas. Uh, Nick has over 16 years of political experience and over eight years of telecommunication experience. He's run voter outreach campaigns for national and local politics, and he developed reach communications with the strategy of providing the highest quality product with a low cost, regardless of the campaign size. Nick's work for national has worked as a national political director for multiple presidential campaigns and he's run a number of state and local races across the country. So with that, I'm going to get started, and I'm going to turn it over to Nick, and he's going to begin today's webinar by talking about robocalls. Thank you, John, for the great intro. I was hoping for a little uh, intro with some music, but we'll, we'll do some 70s music. Yeah, we'll be, we, have, we have some technical challenges today <laughs> here with the presentation, so maybe next time we can, uh, we can spice things up with some music. I appreciate you guys having me here today. Uh, obviously, I want to start with robocalls, but I want to touch on something that uh, you brushed on during the intro, uh, calls being more towards the later part of the campaign. Uh, generally, that is true, but you can also use phone calls, uh, both robo and live, uh, for survey and issue ID on the beginning part of your campaign also, um, to kind of get a feel for where the voters are at, um, what issues you should be focusing on, what, what issues are going to move people towards your campaign. Um, and also for name ID to see where you need to work on and what's, what areas. When you get that data back, you can see what towns or what area of the, the district you're 
really need to work on harder to get your name out there. So just want to touch on that a little bit briefly. Now, robocalls for anyone that doesn't know what a robocall is, basically a robotic call, it's done through a phone system and it sends out a thousands and sometimes hundreds or hundreds of thousands of calls a minute um, to phones all over the area. Um, so we get a list that goes into our phone system and we, we target with a message, a survey, uh, whichever one you want. So it's a great effective way to reach voters um, fast and cheap. And by cheap, I mean, we're talking, we mostly start at about four cents a, a call um, for about 60, for a minute call. And you can get a lot done in that 60 seconds. Uh, great way to get your message across. So if you have an issue that, that has come up in your community that you want to take a, take a stance on immediately and you want people to know where you are, you can simply send out a robocall for really dirt cheap um, and have that sent out in a matter of an hour or two uh, to your constituents. So it's a great way to, to do that. If you want to do survey calls, um, you can do surveys with those. Now, survey calls on, on robocalls, I do want to warn that generally uh, participation does drop out because you can tell that there's no interaction on a robocall with a live person. It's a, the other end of that phone, they, they know it's not a, a real call. Um, but you, it's an easy way to just do a short survey. I wouldn't recommend surveys uh, over two to three questions. Um, but again, I would strongly suggest robocalls for uh, messages. Get out to vote is almost imperative that you use uh, robocalls uh, to get out the vote efforts. Um, reason being is all you're really talking about on a get out the vote is reminding them to get out the vote. Chances are, in most cases, these are already your supporters, are already likely going to be your supporters. That's who you should be calling in GOTV, anyways. Um, and you're going to call them, use these, these type of calls generally within the first, last four or five days of an election, day of an election. And basically these are just to get remind people to get out and vote and what time the polling locations are and, and who you are that last minute uh, sentence or two pitch on why they need to vote and why they need to vote for you or your candidate. Um, again, very cheap. You, we have another option which is they have been proven to be very effective is voicemails. Um, you can send these calls directly to voicemail and bypass a live person. That way they have the feel of getting that live call from either a candidate personally uh, or a staff member or volunteer when they get home from work or uh, home from the grocery store on the weekend. They can get those so they can bypass a live, live answer and go right to voicemail so it feels like it's coming back and then you can have your, your staff or your campaign phone number have them call back if they have any questions about you as a candidate uh, or when the election day is. Um, Another thing we've started to see an uptick in uh, in robocalls is as an idea for event invites. So if you have an event coming up and you want to get the most bang for your buck to try to invite people to um, your event, you can set it up to where you can actually build an RSVP list through robocalls. So simply put, you ask them if they, you know, why, what the event is, would you like to RSVP for the event? Please press one now if you'd like to RSVP. So what happens in that case is that the press one, it'll show back on the data when, when you get the data back, and you'll have their name, their address, whatever was given to us on the voter file. That way, you've, you, you've built a list of an RSVP um, for your event, and we've seen it grow uh, a little bit better than than mail in recent months and years uh, because people are generally uh, getting a lot of junk mail, especially towards the end of an election. So with, phone, with the event invitations, um, it's been a growing uh, number of people interested in doing those, and it's very effective. Um, back to survey calls a little bit, it's the same thing as a touch tone. We also do IVR, which is uh, voice responses, basically. So they can respond with their voice. Uh, yes, I'll support that candidate. Uh, my top issue is uh, taxes and spending. And those get recorded. Uh, a lot of people are going to IVR. I'm still old school where I, we, we believe in touch tone uh, because you still have a lot of those older voters who just 
uh, either the, the system doesn't pick up their voice loud enough, um, or you know, when someone pushes a number, you know that it's going to that to that issue. So just to clarify for the people on the webinar, IVR that's voice recognition, right? Yep. IVR is voice recognition. Okay. And uh, so this, these tactics that you're talking about now get back to something you mentioned earlier, uh, in, right after your introduction, which is that um, this is a good tool. Surveying is a good tool to help you in the early stages of your campaign to understand what's important to the voters. So we stress uh, during our preparation phase that candidates make sure they create an issue list and figure out where they stand on the issues. But that doesn't necessarily tell you what's important to your constituents. And that, that's something that these phone calls can, do, can help you with, right? Exactly. And I think if, if you're running for office, at the early stages, I would suggest highly in investing in an issue survey before you do it, anything. I mean, obviously, yes, you guys tell, start out on each issue, where you stand on each issue. But sometimes a lot of those issues aren't as important to the average voter. I mean, it might be important to someone that's involved in politics, that's running for. But I think a good way to, do, to start that process is do an issue survey figure out the top issues, and that's where you want to focus your, your time then. Right, before you go out and spend a bunch of money on printed materials, for exactly. example, and then you find out, uh, you know, a few weeks or a month before the election that the number one issue that you've been focusing on is, is number four on your constituents list, and you've spent all that money on the printed material, and it's too late to do anything about it. Uh, and uh, to that point exactly, and you bring up a great thing, I had a, a client that, that picked us up late in their campaign that had all this printed material, they were running on issues. I said, did you guys ever do an issue survey? Well, no, we, we know what the issues are. We read in the paper. We, I said, okay, well, let's, let's do an issue survey. So they did one. The four top issues they were talking about, only two of them were in the top six. Right, um, and, and, and the, I imagine that's pretty common because a lot of times what happens is, especially in the social media echo chamber, you might, you might be constantly hearing about one or two issues. And so you think that that's what everybody else is concerned about too. But you've got all kinds of other dynamics at play. You've got the silent majority, uh, people who aren't on social media, people who you know, have a particular stance on an issue, who never speak up. Uh, the only time they, their voice is ever heard is at the polling location. Exactly. And, you know, we got to think, too, I mean, everyone on this call, obviously, me and you are, are all political. The average person that goes out there and votes is not watching CNN at 6 o'clock. Chances are they're probably watching Sports Center. Right. So the issues change a little bit, and it's good to get that out there. And you can draw from those issues some data points also. Um, you can look at it and break it down by, by what region in your district. Some issues are, might be more important. Uh, if you have a multi-town district, uh, maybe there's a big tax issue in one of the towns, so that's a big issue for that area. Maybe, you know, uh, opioid issue in a major city that you're representing is a big issue, but not in the town next to it. Right, or even within a city, different wards or different oh, sections of the city I see it are going to vary greatly in terms of... You got the, the, inner city versus the outskirts, it's, it, it really varies. And it's good to, to kind of get that the dynamic and, and look at it and break it, break down the data by issue. Um, so back to your point, yeah, it's it's crucial to get that issue stuff. Because if you're running on stuff that no one cares about, you get an uphill battle. Right. Um, Pass-through calls are something we do. Uh, they're a little bit more expensive, uh, but they're, they're effective. They're generally more geared towards um, organizations, uh, what they do is we'll take it on a call and ask someone to um, call another uh, a congressman or another elected official, a, a selectman or a, a town counselor, and urge them to support or ask them why they support this issue, basically to give this a, a headache um, call for who, who we're patching through to. Another way it can be helpful though to a campaign is if you want, are you looking for volunteers? 
And capture calls are good through that sense of, would you like to volunteer, press one now, we'll patch it through to our office. And basically what happens, you'll have a staff there, a volunteer on the other end, get these incoming calls from our calls going out saying, yeah, I want to volunteer. Generally what happens is, the reason I like capture calls for volunteers, when you ask someone, do you want to volunteer, and then it takes a week to get back to them, they're probably not going to volunteer. If you can get them live and on the phone right at that right at that second, and then give them something to do with that within days, you're more likely to get them active. Yeah, I mean that's really important because a lot of times what will happen is people will say, "Oh yeah, sounds good," and they have every intention of volunteering, and then the phone rings, the kid starts crying, you know what? Life happens, and they just they just totally forget. I'm so, guilty of it. Yeah, yeah, we all are. Um, and then we got scripts. So scripts can make a call absolutely worthwhile and successful, or it can do absolutely nothing for you and waste your money. So that's why on all of our jobs that we have and all of our clients that we have and, and people we do calls for, we always look over our, their scripts. We've been doing this um, 16, 17 years now. So we know what we're looking for in a script and what will engage people. And it's always changing because sometimes scripts obviously run dry. People start, everyone starts using the same thing. So you got to kind of use the trigger points to keep people active and pick up the phone. Um, so what we do as a service, no charge, is we always look through the script and work through a script generation process uh, with anyone, any one of our clients. Um, so that's something that, that's an added benefit uh, through our company. Then we got live calls. Live calls are exactly what they are. It's a call agent, professional call agent with a professional call center um, that does the calling for you. Now, we've a lot more people have been going to live calls because they're than they do volunteer calls, partially because they're very professional. Um, quality is is superb and you can get your data fairly fast. You don't have to wait weeks or months for volunteers to go through calls. You can have it in a day or two. Uh, we're calling the same amount of people, getting the same, generally a uh, lot more uh, turnout on the calls. So they're all professional agents. Um, they are both political and um, private sector callers. So these are the same people that would be calling for like a Walmart promotion, uh, business to business leads. So they, they do this for a living. So it is phenomenal uh, work. You get to see the data uh, every night, what's coming in. You can also listen into the calls to see what, what's going on and see the quality of the calls. Um, so it's a nice benefit. The, and there's no uh, language barriers, really. I mean, you don't have someone with a deep, heavy southern accent unless you're in the south, then we can get, we can get calls specific for that. Um, we also do. Uh, Spanish calling. So if you're in a Spanish district, we did this in Miami a couple times, a couple clients, um, they wanted to call Spanish uh, households. So we had Spanish callers go in. Um, we've done some French callers. So really we are well versed in this and we've been recognized across the country for, for our live calls. Um, surveys, again, similar thing. These you can generally get four or five questions out of. Uh, before you see, start seeing a significant drop in participation. Uh, basically by that, I mean, someone picks up the call, they do a couple questions, and they're like, I got stuff to do. Uh, and then they hang up the phone. You can go for, we've done as many as 20 question surveys, uh, but we just generally warn that you're, you're going to lose some of your questions uh, and, and participants after about five on live calls. We do leave voicemail messages uh, with a live person. So if they don't get through to someone and you want to leave a voicemail, uh, be a live person on the line. Uh, this is an excellent way to get quality data collection. So if you're really looking for issues, you're really looking for people that are supporting your supporters in, out there that you don't have information on, um, you're trying to gain support, this is a phenomenal way to do so. And I, I believe on the downloads we have a, prescri a persuasion script um, that has worked out tremendously in the past two years we've developed of 
it, it identifies the person's issue. And then it goes into a paragraph persuasion of that candidate's issue. And then it, it follows that by asking, did this, did this issue and his, his or her stance uh, move you in any way? So that way you can see is the response working to that, that issue. And you can also get the issue data back. Generally, what we do too is when you find undecided people in these calls and you have them linked to an issue from our calls, that is that is now your target. You need to move those, those undecided voters that we've identified through calls with the issue that we identified that is linked to them. And you do that through mail, personalized letter to them uh, on that issue, um, what, what, where you stand on that issue as a candidate, and follow it up with more calls. And like calls after that mailer, did we, you know, learning more about, about such and such position on on, on taxes? Uh, can he he or she count on your support? And you, it's amazing to see the movement of these undecides once you once you really make it personal to them. Um, so that's a huge thing, and, and the data collection is a campaign. Don, uh, John, you know. Yeah, data is huge in campaign. Yeah, and and just for the the people on the call, I just wanted to make you aware that we do have um, on our website one of the ebooks that we have uh, available is our digital infrastructure ebook. Um, it's almost 100 pages long, and one of the big sections in there it does describe uh, how to build a database. So if you're going to be investing in doing these live calls or any kind of survey really uh, that is really important to have a database where you can store these voters answers and be able to build a persona uh, and, and be able to, to custom tailor your email outreach so for example you know just to elaborate on you know what Nick was just describing as you're doing these calls you're building out your database and you're able to tag different voters in your database and know what issues are important to them. So you'll actually be able to send out issue specific emails. If some, if education is somebody's top issue, you can send out an email that specifically addresses what you're going to do about education, whatever the issue is. So you want to make sure that you have uh, the right tools in place to be able to leverage that information that you're collecting. I'm glad you brought up email because on the live calls to call agents, um, we've started to find a lot of success in gathering emails. So now you can you can use live calls uh, and our agents to gather these voters' information, these, these voters' emails. A lot of voter reg files don't have emails on them, and most states yeah. don't even ask for it. Um, so what we've done now is you know, if you want more information, try to get them engaged in the call. And we've been able to get a good number of emails through phone calls to build email lists too. So everyone has a phone number on a voter registration generally. Those are the, the most contact information. Adding the email to, to someone's uh, file and, and database is huge. So that's another thing. And it doesn't take a whole lot to, for us to take an email down uh, as far as call agents, so it doesn't eat up a lot at the time of the call. So that's another thing too. Is thinking about is doing it for email data collection. Also, uh, we also have pass through calls. We already touched base on that. And the robots, very same thing, just a live call, event invitation. Also, same thing. Uh, fundraising. Fundraising is becoming more and more difficult in the political world, especially for smaller candidates. Um, we do fundraising calls uh, through live call agents. We used to do it and take credit cards. We no longer do that. Uh, a lot of the reason was the numbers just didn't make sense for us to do it. Uh, people aren't going to get their phone, their credit card over the phone anymore. So to, to us to offer it, it was it was a disservice to our clients because we knew the numbers were never going to they weren't going to really get a lot of people giving their phone uh, their uh, credit card over the phone. So now what we've done is we work with our clients to where they have a donate page on their website. And our callers, if they are interested in, in donating some money 
Mark Paulus will walk them through the website or tell them what website to go to to donate. And in some cases, we've had uh, a link on their website with a section on the donate page. So where did you hear? Was this from the phone call or not? That way you can trace it. Um, but luckily, most of the time, especially the landlines, these people are home, and we can do it over the phone. But that process has been a little bit more successful because it's given them a little bit more, it put them more at ease than giving us a credit card with phone. Um, and then the same thing with scripts again with live calls. We are nationally recognized for, for our scripts and how we do them. Um, so we always help our clients with, with their scripts, make sure that, you know they're getting the most out of out of what they're they're trying to do um, and get quality out of it. And just as a reminder to everybody, or in case you joined late, we are going to have a link uh, at the end of the webinar, a download link to that will uh, that has a couple of call scripts in it. Uh, one that is tailored towards your own volunteers making calls, and then another one that uh, Nick had mentioned earlier, which is more issue based, and it's got a whole uh, flow to it. To walk the callers uh, uh, through that script. And I just want to pause here for a second and remind everybody that there is uh, a question feature on the webinar down below. So as we're going through, if you have any questions, please feel free to toss those questions out and uh, we, we will answer them either as we're going along or um, at, the end of the, uh, at the end of the presentation here. Um, this next slide is one of my new favorites. Um, we've been doing it for years, but it's, it's really starting to grow and it, the technology around it's getting uh, tremendous. Uh, Teletown halls. And I'm sure most of you are now starting to hear about it. Uh, used to be that they were so high priced that they were only for larger campaigns. Um, that's changed dramatically over the past four or five years. So. Tell town hall, basically, if you don't know what it is, imagine yourself going to a regular town hall at you know, the local library or, or town hall and answering and asking questions of the candidate. Well, now you do it over the phone. And with this day and age where everyone's so busy and, and running around, it really makes it easy um, to get in front of a, a huge audience and take questions from real voters and, and let them hear your responses. Um, how it works is we'll, we'll get a list of where you want us to call. Um, about two minutes before the, the scheduled Teletown Hall, we'll blast out those calls to voters and ask them if they're interested in partaking, partaking in um, the Teletown Hall. They'll press one, then they'll go into basically a giant chat room. They won't be able to hear any, anyone else on, on the call just the uh, host, which would be the host and the candidate, or just the candidate. You can have both. Uh, someone that will host the call, like an MC. And then what we'll do is, for, for those who didn't pick up, we'll leave a message saying, sorry, we missed you. We're hoping you joined the town hall. Uh, you know, please call our office if there are any questions. All these town halls can be recorded. So you can use this for further campaign events down the road put it on your website, and uh, really it's a long-term great thing to have. Once the town hall, teletown hall gets started, you usually start with the host introducing who's you know, the candidate, do a five to 10 minute intro of the candidate, uh, basically giving their background, why they're running. Um, and then from there, we'll generally have uh, what we call screeners. So the host will ask anyone with a question for, um, John Doe running for, for selectman, please press one now. That whoever wants to ask a question will go into a question queue where we'll have screeners who work for the campaign or volunteers for the campaign. Um, screen the questions and they'll type it out so the host can see what questions are out there. That way it's a controlled environment. You're not having a lot of crazy questions out there um, or people just trying to hijack, you know, yeah, and you get opponents that a lot. trying to hijack. You get that a lot. Um, you know, we, we try to maintain, you know, the list we get. Hopefully, a lot of the people that, that 
the campaign those and scrubbed out of there. But mm -hmm. you know, for the most part, we've I've never in my experience with the telecom halls had any of those get through a screener. Uh, and you can generally tell. And then the good questions you can bump up on the question queue. Um, and it's a really great feature. And then that person gets to ask their own question uh, to the entire Teletown Hall. Or you can have the option of where the screen will say, you know, John from Manchester Ward 6 uh, has this question. Uh, do you plan on repealing Obamacare? And then it goes from there. You get a lot of participation. You ask that multiple times throughout, throughout the, the Teletown Hall. Then you got real-time surveys. So real-time surveys um, is beneficial. So if you want to see you know, the pulse of the room, pulse of the Teletown Hall, you know what what issues most important to you? Did, you know, did my answer on um, spending or my answer on on civil liberties uh, cover your your position? Did, did, did it move you in any way? You can do those real-time surveys uh, during the call. And then you can have the you can see the information coming on the software on your computer, and you can talk about that. Uh, so you can have a back and forth. Another way to do it, a great way of thing is again collecting emails on these. Uh, anyone that get you know close can say or the candidate can say, anyone who wants to give their email uh, during the call, please press two. We can provide you more information or show you how to get involved. Um, we've had tremendous luck in that as well. Uh, recruiting volunteers. Uh, generally, as a rule, I like to have all my camp, all my clients at the end of the call say, or the host say, um, if you're interested in getting involved in our campaign, we, we need your help. You know, press one now. One of our staffers will pick up, and uh, we will uh, get you involved immediately. Um, fundraising. Fundraising, another one. And this one is generally suggested with if you have a list of, you know donors uh, that you want to have a joint call with, you can do that and they can fundraise and give a credit card right over the phone to our call agents. And we can set up to where your bank accounts, your campaign accounts in there, and you'll get it uh, through that system. Um, so these telecom halls are, for what they offer, fairly inexpensive. So you've outlined a lot of different things you could do with a telecom hall. Let's say, I think a lot of our audience, they're going to be either first time candidates or they're going to be running small campaigns. So let's say they, they only have the budget to do this once. Yep. Is there a best time in the campaign to do that time wise, meaning earlier in the campaign? Is this a good get out the vote tool? If, if you, if the campaign's on a budget and say they only have the money for one Teletown Hall, I would certainly do it the last week of an election. Okay. Uh, when it, the reason I say that too is most people are really paying attention that last week. Right. Uh, and this way, it, it's whatever you said in this Teletown Hall has geared them to vote for you or it's fresh in their mind. So it's not like a month out. I would say if you're on a budget and you can only afford one Teletown Hall, I would, I would certainly do it and I would certainly do it the last week of the election. Okay. Makes sense. Um, Phone banking is not uh, new to anyone that's been involved with politics, but uh, you know, gone are the days of when you had a paper list in front of you and you're using your own phone in most cases, uh, or using a campaign with a bunch of wires that had individual phone numbers to it. Uh, so if you are a campaign that wants to do phone banking and has an office or you have volunteers that can come into your home, uh, to a central area, what this is, is it's a, a server that you rent from us and it goes into your, your location. You rent uh, phones with us that have an LED screen on it and comes with a software, that you uh, web-based software. You go when you log in, you have your own account number. You can upload your own list at any time. You can upload your own script at any time. You can upload a list and a script specific for just one login for a volunteer that's specific to a neighborhood, uh, which we've developed and has been working phenomenal for us. Um, is if you have a, 
person that's in a neighborhood that has you have some undecided voters in or voters that you are not so you're not sure supporting or trying to ID, uh, let that neighbor call that neighborhood. You know, they, they know about the neighborhood issues, they know about the area. You can you can bring it down to that level and load a list up of 200 names in a specific script for that person and let them go to town on that line. And it's all calling from the same number. So if anyone calls back, they're always going to get the campaign office. Right. And in that way, the volunteers aren't using their personal phones to make to make the calls. Exactly. And, you know, you can track too with, the, with this system. You can't track with a personal phone of how many calls they make in per minute. Right. How long are they staying on the phone? Uh, what happens when they leave that office and someone calls their number back? That's scary. Uh, you can't control it. Right. So what we with this system, you can see on each volunteer's ID number because you can you can set it up to each volunteer having their own ID login. How many calls they've made per hour, the length of their calls, what surveys they've done for calls, and we've had some issues where volunteers come in and. You know, especially like the younger kids, they don't want, they're not really there. They're trying to, sometimes they're trying to get credits. Right. And they're right. pushing through through numbers. Um, you can see that uh, right away and, and stop it. So it's a, it's a great way to engage volunteers, reach voters, and have full control of uh, and be able to upload and do scripts at a very small targeted rate versus like a live call center, we have a 5,000 record minimum. You don't have that here. And you buy minutes, and you can do what you want with it. Right. Uh, and it's cheap. Yeah, and, and it, it keeps things efficient um, and helps. If you've got, let's say you've got 5 or 10 or 20 volunteers willing to make phone calls for you, right? Yep. It eliminates the headache of dividing up the list and saying, all right, you call these people, you call these people, and and making sure that people don't get called twice or people don't get called at all. It's all centralized and, and managed through this one system. Yeah, that's a great point. It does all managed. So basically you have a list and for each record, it'll pull uh, three or four numbers at a time into each phone so that there's no duplicate phones. Right. You know, it's done. And you know, back in the old days, you had the, the list list, you had to check off and someone had to go back at the end of the night and put it back in the Excel of the data data file, and right. it just took forever. Now it's all done instantly as soon as the call is done. Right. Uh, you just pull the list down from the, from the wonderful cloud that we have now, yep. and uh, you're done. You put it in your database. Okay. So um, we've got a number of questions coming in. We're going to, uh, some of them sort of overlap, so we're going to get to them in just a minute. But uh, let's just wrap up by talking about uh, budgeting and just do, doing some uh, comparative, uh, some comparisons of what the different types of campaigns are, are going to cost. Yeah, so listen, it, it varies uh, drastically on quantity. A lot of it has to do with quantity. So like a live call. And, and just what's on the screen right now, there's, a, there's a, a, a table on the slide that's being displayed. And this these are just indicative costs for like 10,000 names. So obviously, to your point, it's gonna it's gonna go up and down depending on quantity. Yeah, it fluctuates. I mean, so you look, let's take a look at robocalls for example. For ten thousand, you're looking at four hundred dollars. Um, you know, we'll take. There's no real limit on robocalls. We usually stop at a hundred record of a hundred. So hundred thousand. Hundred names. Oh, a hundred names. Yeah, because once you get to a hundred, they're paying a lot more than they probably should be. When they could probably just pick up a phone and dial those hundred names. Oh, okay. Um, but we don't have, there's no limit on maximum. That's a, okay, a lower limit. So lower no limit. no less than 100 names. No less than 100 Gotcha, names. all right, I, I misunderstood. Okay. Yep. Um, so generally with uh, robocalls, it's to give a, a real, if someone's trying to budget right now, it's generally four cents per call uh, for a 60 second call. So you can, and obviously, if it goes up to, you know, we're talking 25,000, I don't know if anyone on this call is going to have that, but, you know, the, the rate starts to drop a little bit. Uh, if you add some questions to it, the rate will go up a little bit. Um, but that's the base rate right there is four cents per record, which you have right there. 10,000 would cost you 400 bucks. Uh, so as you can see, to reach 10,000 voters for 400 bucks, yeah, that's cheap. Um, and it's very effective. You can get 
any kind of message out that you want. Then you go to live calls. Uh, like I said before, live calls are a little more expensive than paying, you know, a live call agent. Um, but you're getting a lot better quality um, with these calls, and you're getting a better uh, return rate. Uh, you're going to see a lot more support coming out of these calls, a more interaction. Another thing our call agents do too is if you have a website, they'll have a website up in front of them while they're making the call. So if there is a question, they can provide that. Um, also, if they said, well, how do I get in touch with the campaign? But here's their number. Uh, feel free to give us a call. Um, so that right there, is starting rate for live calls is 38 cents per record or per call. Um, and that's the starting rate. That's for two or three questions on top included with that. And that goes up well, if you want to add more questions. Obviously, it takes longer to get the call, so we pay our agents more. But uh, we do have a 5,000 record minimum on live calls. Um, that's just based because we, we have a call center and we bring people, agents in. We got to pay them by hour. So 5,000 uh, records, that's the, the minimum for that. So then you have the Telltown Hall. Telltown Hall is the pricing is uh, complex because the more numbers you have, the more minutes you're spending. Um, but it's not, uh, we have a full sheet, and anyone is interested in, in getting the full sheet of pricing for that. Um, they can obviously email us, there should be a slide after the, the, uh, the uh, call. But like a, any list size, uh, 660 records or less, is gonna cost you 525 bucks. And that's for a 45 minute town hall. Um, you know, you're going to go up to, say, 1,500 records, you're looking at about $1,000. And obviously, the more you spend, the more, more higher the list, the number goes down drastically per record. Um, but again, that, that is a great service. Add-ons to that service, if you need it, is uh, we have a full service option. So if you don't have any staff or anything, you want to do a town hall, but you need people to help screen, um, or you can go help post. We also offer that too. Um, generally, it's about $100 to $200 uh, per staff to help. And we also do the past few calls. Those are a little more money on top of that. And they're usually about uh, 11 cents per transfer. And the phone banking, um, that varies because you, you buy the minutes. It depends on how many phones you need. Uh, the server will be the same cost, but it depends on the quantity of phones, the amount of minutes you're looking for, and generally it's built at three month increments. Um, that generally starts about fifteen hundred dollars. Okay. And so that that's got sort of a fixed and a variable component to it. Correct. Right. Okay. All right. Well, thanks for all that info, Nick. Um, at this point, we're going to start the Q and A. Like I said, we we've, we've got a number of questions in here. Some of them have a little bit of overlap. So the first one I'm going to there's two questions that are, are related here. So um, one question is, if you don't have a list, where do you get it? How, you know, how can a first time candidate get their hands on a list? And then the related question is, um, somebody asked, our election commission does not compile phone numbers and most people are using cell phones today anyway. How do we get the most accurate list of voter phone numbers if there is such a thing? All right, let me take that first piece. Uh, so as far as obtaining a list, in a lot of states we can, we can get a list for you. Um, a, a, another way to look at that is I would reach out to your state um, parties, Democrat, Republican, and see if they uh, can, they have a list and they can buy it with you. Most of them do uh, at no charge um, if you're part of their party affiliation. Uh, another thing we can do is we have, we work with many vendors uh, that have lists that they've built throughout the country. And depending on what you're looking for, obviously we know, you know what, what the demographic is you're looking for in your list, uh, what the party affiliation you're looking for in your list, um, you know, the, the area you're looking for the list and we can generally get a quote and a list within 24 to 48 hours for you um, with phone numbers um, there are four or five major companies we work with that we've gotten the cost down for our our clients for, for our lists 
uh, that do this as a living. They go out and they, they try to gather this information. They get phone numbers. They try to get matching with merchants' data um, to get the best information possible for lists. So if a list is, is something you need, um, it's usually not that difficult to get. I mean, there are a couple of states that are, don't really record a lot of information. Um, but lists, and it will cost a little bit more uh, as far as the phones, but we can, uh, we can find a list for you depending on what you want. So I guess there are basically two, two categories of things. Reach out to your party. That would be my first thought. First thing, see what they have, and then you can always purchase a list. Correct. And another thing, too, is depending on how small of a race you're running, especially if it's just a town, uh, a lot of the towns will sell you their the data. And it's public information. Yep. So if you go to a town hall or a city hall and ask for the voter registration, a voter file of last year's election, um, they'll provide it for you. And usually it's not too expensive. Um, you know, I know in some places it's as little as $100. Uh, so I would, first stop I would do is obviously go to your party, see what they have, what they're going to give you. Um, second would be going to the town hall uh, or city hall and seeing how much their file would be to purchase. And then I would say the next stop would be, you know, reach out to us and we can, uh, we can get you a file for sure. It's just always looking for the, for the cheapest, most effective option. Right, balancing the, uh, what, what we're always trying to balance, affordability and quality, right? Exactly. Obviously, as a vendor, uh, we love to see our clients win. So the, the farthest you can stretch your dollar is what we want to see. Right. So we've got a few other questions here that are, are also kind of related. Um, one is, you know, asked about robocalling and, you know, what's legal and what isn't. And another question here is asking about do not call lists. Um, is that applicable in elections? How do you make sure you're in compliance with the do not call registry? Do not call, you have to be very careful for. Um, we've seen a number of, of people in this business try to start their own call companies and get burned. You have to know the laws. Um, we have been doing this for a number of years. We, the laws always change. We, we, we work with a lot of states, a lot of secretary of states. Uh, depending on the state, it is a state's issue. Um, the only federal component is you cannot call uh, cell phones with a ro robotic call. Um, so, like, you have states that are completely wide open. doesn't matter what you're doing. Uh, you can call. You just have to leave a disclaimer. There are some states you have to leave this thing within the first 30 seconds of the call. There are other states where you cannot call, do not call list at all. Now, places like New Hampshire, you have to start from do not call. There are a number of other states like that. So what that means is we'll take a list that you provided us. We'll put it into our, what we call as our scrubbing machine. And it scrubs out all the cell phones and scrubs out all of the, those numbers on the do not call list. And from there, now we are in compliance. So we will only call those who are on the do not call list, or who are not on the do not call list. Mm -hmm. Generally what we've done with that too is if they do a robo call for budgeting purposes and want to call all those who are not on the do not call list and then take those who are on the do not call list, they can call those with our live agents if the list is big enough. So it kind of separates it a little bit yep. to kind of get the most out of their money. Yeah, you're segmenting the list. Yeah. So, and if you have a question about robocalls and the legality of it in your state, please feel free to reach out to us. Um, I'm happy to, to answer any questions and, and show you the, the laws in each of the, the state that you might be have questions in um, because they are complex sometimes. You know, sometimes a state will say no robocalls allowed except for political because they don't want telecommunication, you know, they don't want. Uh, fundraising or they don't want uh, sales calls going on to, to everyone's phones around, you know, calls. Mm -hmm. So it, like Maine's like that. Maine's very tricky with how they do it. You know, political calls are, do not call does not pertain to political calls, but it does pertain to sales calls. Right. So um, that actually made me think of a question uh, as, as you were just describing that. So obviously your company does this, so we'd love for 
anybody who needs this service to give you a call. But uh, you, you mentioned that there were, you know, there were, there were people who started this business and, and, and didn't know what they were doing and got themselves in trouble. So what advice would you give to candidates who are out there shopping around for uh, vendors who provide this service? What, what kind of questions can they ask to make sure that it's a legitimate operation and that they're going to get value and they're going to get results? Well, as we know, being as everyone's a political genius. Everyone knows everything. Um, one thing I would do is obviously, one of the big things is ask about the law. See if they know the law, the law in that state. Um, if they don't, it's a, it's a big red flag because that you, you're the one that gets dinged for it if there's an issue. Yeah, that's an important point. Yeah. At the end of the day, as the candidate, you're you're going to be the one left holding the bag. Yep. Very few times they ever go out to the call center. <laughs> <laughs> um, obviously, ask what's your experience. You know, a lot of these, a lot of these uh, companies, and it's not just phones. It's it's the political atmosphere in general because it's so easy to get into. Uh, most cases, um, ask what their experience is. You know, what experience do you have? The other thing I look at too is, is asking for a sample script. That's a telltale sign most of the times on, on how long they've been doing it and uh, the quality of it. Um, also see if they can provide you with uh, some, of, some of their past work experiences. You know, who, who have you had for clients? Yeah. Um, you know, Google their name. Right. You can generally find a lot on, online nowadays. Right. Um, those would be the main questions I would ask. Um, obviously, there are some technical terms that you could ask, but you know, I would certainly ask what what laws in the state, um, how long you've been doing it, what's your background, and ask for that sample script, and uh, you know, go from there. And, and really, you'll you'll be able to tell what kind of clients they had, and what they make sure you ask what they did to that for that client. Yeah. Because sometimes it's just you know, I, I worked on their campaign, but I didn't actually do any phone vending. So. Right, right. Ask yeah, specific questions. Yeah. So um, we're, we're running out of time here, and there's one question that I really wanted to get to, um, and, and that is for a small campaign, you know, you've talked about all of these different things. we got robocalls, live calls, teletown halls, phone banks. For a small campaign, if you had to pick one, which method – is the most effective and there's probably not one answer to this but how would you advise people to what kind of questions would you tell them to think about and, and prioritize tough question um you know it always it obviously depends on the budget i, I think you, you have to throw in a robocall uh at least a GOTV robocall last ditch effort i think that uh, because for the price, you can, anyone can make that happen in a budget. At least one or two robocalls. Um, you know, next I would say it's probably live call. And if you had to do a, if you only could do one live call, I keep it within the first, well, the last two weeks of the election, and really focus on a persuasion script to try to draw people, you know, those who might not know who you are, uh, to your position, your 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 campaign. Mm -hmm. uh, if that's how. If, that's how it's doing on a budget would be live call last two weeks and then two or three or one or two robo calls last minute to draw your voters out. And probably, I, I would guess it would also depend on their name recognition, right? If, if this is somebody who's relatively well known in the community, um, maybe you focus a little more on the get out to vote as a priority as opposed to, you know, getting out there in name recognition, would you... Yeah, I mean, if you're, you're well known, you feel like you have a, a, a good chance, and that's a dangerous, dangerous thing to do. Though, is I've seen it a number, number of times. Candidates that say, "I got the name recognition." Right, I, they're a legend in their own legend. Mind. I sometimes that's a curse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so you got to be careful not to take it for granted. I've seen candidates where they've come out and said, "Listen, I've lived in this this town my whole life. I got this." They lost by about five votes because they just right. didn't put in the extra effort. Right. Um, so, I mean, if you're well known, you have a, you have a good campaign strategy. And it all depends on what the other candidates doing too. Mm -hmm. I don't like basing what we do on a campaign on, on what the other team is doing, but you have to, 
that has to take an effect where you're going to do the last couple of weeks in the election. Right. So robocalls really are, you know, they provide great value. Um, yeah. Yeah. For, for not a lot of money. And, and if you're, if your budget will uh, will tolerate it, then then the live calls and and certainly and the teletown halls uh, those aren't that expensive either. Um, so no, teletown halls, if you got the budget for it, I would suggest at least doing one. Yeah. Uh, and then the phone bank. I mean, phone banking is great, but you got to make sure that you have enough volunteers to do it. Right. Because you're you're paying to rent this stuff. You're going to be paying for whatever minutes you decide you, you think you need. Um, so if you're going to do a phone bank, make sure you have at least five volunteers that are going to come in and make phone calls for you and five volunteers who you know are going to show up and not exactly. just tell you they're going to show up exactly right all right great well uh this has been very informative nick i want to thank you for your time and uh coming in here and sharing your thoughts and experience with us just want to remind people up on the screen right now we've got that link uh that you can just go ahead and type into your browser and that'll be an instant download of the two call scripts that, uh, that, that we're offering to webinar registrants today could help you out a lot um, in, in crafting your own outreach campaigns. I want to thank everybody for joining us on the webinar today. Make sure you're signed up for our uh, newsletter so that you can hear about future webinars. And uh, we will sign off and hope to see you all on the next webinar.